Hi, everyone. I'm Cheryl Butler, and you're listening to the Mighty Mommy's Quick and Dirty Tips podcast, which will help make your life as a parent a little bit easier and a lot more fun. Welcome. Today's episode is number 593, Five Cool Ways to Help Teens Limit Their Screen Time, because some of the most compelling things competing for your teen's attention happen on their device screens. Today, we'll talk about five ways to help your teen get out of the virtual world and into the real one. Even under normal circumstances, managing our kids' screen time has long been a challenge for parents, myself included. But finding a healthy balance between living in the real world and the virtual one can seem almost impossible during a pandemic, when there are so many restrictions on how our kids, especially teens, can spend their free time. So here are five ways the teens in your life can change it up and have some screen-free fun. One, start by considering your own attachment to screens. Before we try and redirect our young adults from their beloved devices, an excellent place to start is by rethinking how we as parents use them. Our children, regardless of their ages, continually observe us. They quietly monitor our daily habits, good and bad, and without our realizing it, they begin to mimic us. We're their ultimate role models. A recent study found that adults, yes, us moms and dads, spend more hours than we'd probably like to admit, glued to gadgets such as phones, laptops, and televisions. Here's a quote from an article by studyfinds.org. A poll of 2,000 British adults commissioned by Vision Direct found that the typical person will spend a staggering 34 years looking at phones, computers, or televisions. During the typical adult lifespan, from ages 18 to 81, researchers say that a person will be glued to their screens for over 13 hours a day. That adds up to 4,000 866 hours each year and a stunning 301,733 hours throughout those 62 adult years. Wow, these statistics floored me. If I'm spending oodles of time attached to my electronics, why wouldn't my children feel they could do the same? Screens in our home provide an effective communication channel with the outside world. But we shouldn't allow easy access to stimulating content like videos, games, and social media to compromise an active lifestyle or direct interaction with loved ones. Before you start trying to shift your kids away from their screens, take inventory of your own screen time. Evaluate how often you hang out in front of the TV. Are you checking texts around the clock, including when your kids are trying to talk to you? Is your laptop propped on the kitchen island 24-7 so it pulls you away even during mealtimes? I'm guilty as charged. If you're conscious of your screen habits, you'll be able to make adjustments and set an excellent example for the rest of your family. I committed to putting my laptop away at 4 o'clock every day and not bringing it out again until we've settled in for after-dinner activities. Here's a quick tip for you it can be surprisingly hard to pull yourself away from the never-ending cycle of news in 2020. If you find yourself endlessly surfing bad news and distressing social media posts, you may be taking part in the doom-scrolling phenomenon. My QDT colleagues just shared some insightful episodes devoted to doom-scrolling. Mignon Fogarty talked about the definition and origins of the word in the Grammar Girl podcast. Dr. Jade Wu explained why surfing bad news can be harmful and offered some tips to help you stop doom scrolling in the most recent Savvy Psychologist episode. Number two, brainstorm a free time list. Have a conversation with your kids before you start laying down new ground rules about limited screen time. When your children feel like you include them in the decision-making process, you have a much better chance at a successful outcome. The majority of my friends are in agreement that their families have more than doubled the time they spend on their devices during the past six months. Some even upgraded their phones and electronics 
so they could stay connected to the outside world at all times. Because family members were spending so much physical time together, they didn't feel it was necessary to stay connected with their immediate loved ones. Being attached to a screen nearly 24-7 was becoming the new norm. One mom came up with a solution that her tweens and teens liked. Brainstorming a list of 50 things, big and small, to reduce screen time. Together as a family, this idea allowed everyone to have input on ways they could hang out and keep busy without any or very limited electronic time. The list ran the gamut from eating dinner outside a couple of times a week to room makeovers in their home. And one ambitious high schooler started her own pet sitting business and was scheduled weeks in advance because she was helping families who were both working from home and doing remote learning that didn't have any extra quality time for their pets. I have a quick tip for you. Check out this creative list of 100 things teenagers can do without screens for lots of cool ideas, and you'll find that on my page related to this episode. Number three, earn device-free credits. And this might be probably my favorite one of all these tips. One thing that has always worked well in getting my brood's attention is offering valuable incentives. I saw an interesting idea mentioned on a Pinterest board last year, trading screen time for money or gift cards. I wasn't crazy about bribing my kids with money, so I modified the idea to benefit the entire family. We all agreed to trade technology hours for activities like reading, biking, gardening, or organizing things like closets and bedrooms. Each hour spent away from our screens earned us $20 to put towards either a family outing or an individual item that one of the kids wanted. Within just three weeks, we banked enough screen-free credits to put towards a weekend getaway at a mountain resort. A long weekend away is something we're all looking forward to. But even better is the fact that each of us realized how much we're enjoying activities other than looking at a phone or a television screen. Number four, get cooking. We all need to eat. That's something every human has in common. I love to cook and try new recipes, and I credit my mother for getting me and my siblings interested in food preparation at a very young age. As the mother of five kids, each born a year apart, she was smart to enlist helpers in the kitchen. There are dozens of ways teens can help out in the kitchen, even if they're not ready to take on concocting a full recipe. Letting them browse your favorite cookbooks is a great way to introduce them to the world of cooking. Books with colorful photos of finished recipes can whet the appetite and pique interest in creating something similar. Teens who have their driver's license can help run to the market. They'll feel great about contributing to the family meal by doing the shopping. Experimenting with new ingredients is also a fun way to appreciate new tastes and cultures. We have recipe tryouts once a week in our home. This allows my kids the opportunity to prepare anything they're interested in making, within reason, and serve it to the entire family. One of my sons enjoys this so much, he teases us at the beginning of the week with his mystery dish and tries to keep us guessing what it'll be. At the same time, one of my daughters discovered that she loves to photograph food. I'm a huge fan of meal planning, and having my kids participate in our weekly menu is a win-win for all. When your kids are involved in the kitchen, not only will you gain extra help throughout the week, but kids will easily stay off their devices for hours at a time. Cooking and eating together as a family, it's one of the best ways to stay connected, regardless of what's happening in the outside world. And check out my episode, why meal planning is essential to a happier family life. I share some helpful tips that can help you implement a meal planning system in your home. And number five, virtual volunteering. There are times when screen time can be valuable. Our new norm of virtual learning has allowed students to continue their education despite our current circumstances. Thanks to the access most have to technology, the chance to continue learning is still available even when our kids can't be in a physical classroom. 
In addition to remote learning, there are also new opportunities to give back in a virtual world. In my popular episode, I'm bored. Nine boredom busters for any age group. I shared some really fun ways that teens can keep busy no matter what, and one way mentioned was giving back. One of the most significant ways to get out of a personal slump is to stop focusing on yourself and spend your time and energy helping others. Teens are at the perfect age to spend their free time giving back, whether they know it or not. And with access to the internet, it's easier than ever to match individual interests with opportunities right in your community. In addition to volunteer choices in your community, these resources are a terrific starting point. Peers and students taking action, serve.gov, volunteen nation, volunteermatch.org, and teensgive.org. Get your teen on board with making a difference in the life of people and fellow students who need support. It might be one of the best decisions that she makes, both on and off screen. How do you reduce screen time in your home? Join the conversation and share your thoughts in the comments section at quickanddirtytips.com/mighty-mommy. The Mighty Mommy Facebook page is another spot that you can interact with me or Twitter. You can also email me at mommy at quickanddirtytips dot com. Listen and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thanks so much for listening. Join me next week for my interview with two very special guests: author and Emmy winner Yorma Takoni, yes, one third of Saturday Night Live's comedy group The Lonely Island, and Dan Santat. Who's a Caldecott medal-winning and best-selling illustrator? As we chat about their soon-to-be-released children's picture book, Little Fox and the Wild Imagination, this dynamic dad duo will share some heartfelt and very funny advice about parenting in the 21st century. Have a great week, which I hope will be filled with super fun activities that don't include your devices. And until next time, happy parenting. <laughs>